our Bible reading is in 2 Samuel chapter 9, and uh, Sam's going to come and read it for us. Thank you, Sam. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king said, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? the king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. So King David had him brought from Lodabar, from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honour. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show your kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belongs to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him and bring in the crops so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son named Micah, and all the members of Ziba's household were servants of Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem because he always ate at the king's table. He was lame in both feet. Thank you, Sam. Good evening. If you'd like to uh, either open or keep your Bibles open at 2 Samuel 9. On a slight break from both sermon series next weekend, so no revelation. You know, if you bring a rest from revelation, jump back to Psalms. And then Sunday evening... Uh, it'll be Romans 12, 1 to 2. Well, that's what I've been told so far. It may, may well change, but that's his plan. Uh, next Sunday evening. So you'll not be in 2 Samuel next Sunday evening either. Uh, but we're doing chapter 9 today, and then we'll be back two weeks' time in chapter 10. Uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, loved to speak about the gospel as a royal marriage. So this is a quote from him. It says, who can understand the riches of the glory of this grace? Here, this rich and divine bridegroom, Christ, marries the poor, wicked harlot, redeems her from all her evil, and adorns her with all his goodness. Her sins cannot now destroy her, since they are laid upon Christ and swallowed up by him. And she has that righteousness in Christ, her husband, of which she may boast of as her own and which she can confidently display alongside her sins in the face of death and hell and say, if I have sinned, yet my Christ, in whom I believe, has not sinned, and all his is mine, and all mine is his. That was his favourite way of summarising the gospel, this picture of a royal marriage. I wonder how you would tell it. I wonder how you would tell the gospel. What would... Uh, uh, to quote him, how would you sing the wondrous story of Christ who died for you? What pictures would you use? What uh, stories might you use to illustrate the gospel, given the opportunity to share it with someone else? We're going to look in 2 Samuel 9 and find a brilliant picture of the gospel. Now, 2 Samuel 7, 8 and 9 are, are not to be understood necessarily in chronological order. They're, they're probably around similar time, but they're not necessarily one after the other. Uh, last week, we saw a summary of David's uh, victories, 
that was a, a, a thing about here's, here's God has given the victories to David over these various people in various places in different battles and culmination is, well, the, the, the land is, is at rest. The borders are established. David is reigning uh, over the, the kingdom. Uh, and 2 Samuel 9 then may well have come after those battles. It may well have been in the middle of it. We don't really know. But it is there, as are uh, chapter 7 and chapter 8, to tell us really important things about the kingdom uh, of God, the Lord's work on behalf of David, and David's, the nature of David's kingship. At the end of last week, we saw that David was ruling over all Israel, and that he was doing what was just and right for all his people. That was verse 15. Uh, and we said that's a point there, didn't we, to Jesus. So David is ruling for his people, justice, righteousness. Ultimately, the prophets then prophesied that the Messiah would come and he would rule in perfect justice and perfect righteousness. Uh, and then when Jesus arrives, we see him live and act that way. And as we've seen in Revelation, we find that ultimately, when the kingdom is fully come fully consummated at the end of time, it will be a place of perfect justice and righteousness. We also thought a little bit about last week, didn't we, that, that then therefore as members of that kingdom, as citizens of that kingdom now, we, we should live seeking justice and righteousness in ways that we can. Again, here in chapter 9, there is a beautiful story now from David's reign. Again, another example of how David points positively towards the Messiah to come. We are, in reality, still in the section of 2 Samuel where David is, is in the good books. <laughs> where David, up to this point, we have good, positive examples of David and his Rain. And this chapter, arguably, is probably David at his absolute best. So in terms of seeing David in the most positive light, it's probably here. Um, it's not as action-packed as the defeat of Goliath, because you might be saying, oh, I like that one better. Uh, that is more action-packed true, and it is a very good example of David trusting the Lord. But I wonder whether this one, maybe not as uh, uh, full of action, maybe not the same Hollywood blockbuster feel, but actually uh, no less stunning in the way it shows David as a positive pointer towards the Messiah. So look at verse 1. David asks, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now this isn't about David just waking up one day and thinking, you know what, I think I'd like to be nice to somebody today. Uh, I'll just go and find out who I can be nice to. Maybe I'll particularly be nice to somebody from Saul's household. So, you know, let's, let's do something good. Wasn't that, that wasn't what David did. He didn't just wake up on a, on a positive note and think, yeah, I'll be kind to somebody. To understand what David is saying here in verse 1, we have to jump back to 1 Samuel chapter 20. Now, if you remember, David and Jonathan have this wonderful example of friendship where they have this deep commi commitment, this deep connection to one another because of their shared aims and their shared goals. And in 1 Samuel 20, verses 14 and 15, we find Jonathan saying this to David, But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness as long as I live, so that I may not be killed and do not ever cut off your kindness from my family. Not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan calls David to do and David agrees. And now David is remembering that promise. David is remembering what he is committed to. And David is making good on it. Because he didn't make it lightly. He didn't just say to Jonathan, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, fine, we'll try it. He, he commits to that in a very clear uh, way. And David also made a similar promise, interestingly, to Saul, not exactly in the same way he did with Jonathan, but Saul speaking in 1 Samuel 24 says this, I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not kill off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. So David gave his oath to Saul. And Saul returned home and David and his men went up to the stronghold. It is that covenant commitment of David, particularly to Jonathan, but also the promise he made to Saul that is behind this question in verse 1. Because when David says, is there anybody I can show kindness to? 
The word in Hebrew is the word hesed. Now it appears in verse 1, and again in verse 3, and again in verse 7. And if it's not a word you're familiar with now, it is a good word to become familiar with. I'm not saying it's the most important Hebrew word, but if you're going to remember a Hebrew word, hesed is a good one to remember, because it is language of covenant. It is language of covenant faithfulness. It is language of the Lord's steadfast love for his people. Some translations translate hesed, loving kindness. That's what we're talking about here. That's what David is wanting to show to Jonathan's descendants. For the sake of Jonathan, for the sake of his best mate, for the sake of the guy he covenanted with in this way, he wants to show covenant faithfulness, covenant love. He wants to keep his promise. And so he calls a guy called Zeba. There was a servant in Saul's household and this guy comes to David uh, and, and the conversation that follows, David expresses his desire to make good on this promise. Look, is there anybody still living? It's been a while, but is there anybody still alive that I can show this kindness to? Uh, and we find out there is. And the description that Zeba gives, we know who it is. So if we remember chapter 4 and verse 4, we know that John's not a son. We know that that son was lame. And we know that as his nurse tried to escape when, uh, when she thought she needed to get him out, she tragically drops him and, and actually that makes his condition worse. It's also by this point, the reason David is questioning this, is there anybody still alive, is because likely it's at least 15, maybe 20 years after he made the promise to Jonathan. Mephibosheth has grown up, we find out later on in the chapter he's got his, a kid of his own. So potentially Mephibosheth is what, early 20s maybe? He's now not that little boy, five years old, that we read about in chapter 4. And it turns out he's living in a house, uh, maybe being looked after by Machia, maybe that because he was unable to, to walk because he was lame in both feet, he had somebody who cared for him and looked after him day by day. Either way, he's not living in a particularly well-known or nice place. Lodabar is not a place we know where it is. Uh, historians, uh, Bible scholars, they're not quite sure where it was. It's not a well-known or well-recorded name of a place, but that's where Mephibosheth has been living, a bit of a nowhere town. But when David finds out he's there, uh, the fact that he's lame in both feet doesn't put him off. Now, we might be used to that. We live in a day where disability and, and that is, is championed and, and, and there's equal rights and all those kind of things. In this culture, to be lame in both feet would have been seen as a, as a bad thing. You find it in the Gospels when, when Jesus gets asked, well, who sinned, this man or his parents, that, he, that he's like this? Jesus says, well, neither. He recorrects their thinking, but that was the kind of thinking in there. This would have been seen as a huge negative and probably a reason for David to go, you know what, I'm not going to do it. But it doesn't put him off. It doesn't change his mind. He calls for Mephibosheth to be brought to him. Now, you've got to imagine Mephibosheth has been living in this little place, probably in the middle of nowhere, minding his own business for the last 20 years, then gets a message that a king wants to see him. Now, Mephibosheth, we don't know what he thought, but if I'm Mephibosheth, I'm thinking, oh, great. The king is calling me to Jerusalem to speak to him. And I'm thinking, hold on a minute. New dynasties usually wipe out everybody from the previous dynasty. New dynasties will do that because, well, they don't want a coup. They don't want the previous guys trying to wrestle power back again, like a lion who takes over a pride, often kills any of the cubs of the previous alpha male. Mephibosheth, grandson of the former king, and not just any king, the king who tried to kill David on multiple occasions, has probably sat there thinking to himself, this is the end. I've had a nice peaceful life for a little while, but this is probably it. It's probably game over for me. Now, he doesn't refuse to go to the king, he goes, but however long his journey took, I imagine there was a lot on his mind. He probably doesn't know. In fact, it's really unlikely that he knows the commitment that David made to Jonathan. He was only five-year-old when his dad died. So even if his dad had told him, look, David's going to look after you, whether he remembered as a five-year-old and whether he thought David would remember it himself, we don't know. Chances are he had no idea. He's thinking, David is tying up loose ends. This is it. But like I say, he goes. And then we read these words. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, 
Notice it's sort of Saul included in there too, because the promise is made to both. But also we know what Saul used to do. When he came to David, he bowed down and paid him honour. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied, Do not be afraid, David said to him. Now there's a potential hint that David is going to make good on the covenant because of the change in language. David is predominantly referred to as the king up to this point. But when he meets for Phibosheth, the, the narrator just calls him David for the next few bits of interaction. Either way, if that's a subtle shift, it, it helps us see that. But the words, if we were in any doubt that David was going to make good on the promises, his first words are to name Mephibosheth and then to tell him not to be afraid. David knows, doesn't he? I think that's why we can surmise that Mephibosheth was probably a bit apprehensive because David's first words to him as he enters are, do not be afraid. Don't worry about it. I'm not, not here to pop you off. This is not the end of the road for you. In fact, it's the exact opposite. David's words must have probably stunned Mephibosheth a little bit, but at least put him at ease. But then what follows must have nearly knocked him over in disbelief. Because not only does David tell him not to be afraid, he says, for. So here's why you don't need to be scared, Mephibosheth. Here's why. For I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, and you will always eat at my table. And David's intentions for Mephibosheth couldn't be much clearer, could he? He basically says, look, I'm going to properly look after you. I'm going to properly look after you. I am going to be, effectively, abundantly gracious to you and your family. This is the key verse, really, in the entire chapter. Verse 7. Because David is going to show covenant love and faithfulness. And that is what gives the assurance to Mephibosheth. That's why he can be sure, because this is a covenant love. This is a commitment. This is David seeking to model God's covenant love for his people in his own covenant love for Mephibosheth. covenant love of David is going to be shown, isn't it, in Mephibosheth moving to the capital city. So he's no longer going to be in a little nowhere place. He's now in the, in the safe place, the city, the main place of the whole kingdom. His grandfather's servants are now going to be his servants. And we're told that Ziba has got is it 15 sons and 20 servants, or the other way around. Yeah, 15 sons and 20 servants. This is not a small entourage. These guys are going to be specifically looking after Mephibosheth and his little boy. He's going to have the land that belonged to Saul. The king had a particular plot of land, and off that the king would get whatever he got, but now Mephibosheth is going to get it. So whatever comes out of that land is his, to do with what he wants. The fruit of the land will be his. But actually, he's probably not going to need to eat any of it, because he's eating at David's table. So he can do what he wants with it. He could give it away, he could sell it, he could do whatever. Because everything is being provided for him. David's actions are based on a promise, on a covenant commitment, on love. Not anything in Mephibosheth to make David think, yep, yeah, I'll bring him and I'll set him up. And because of anything Mephibosheth has done or hasn't done, it is a completely unconditional thing. Mephibosheth doesn't have to do anything. No caveats to David's promise to Jonathan. David didn't go, you know what? I actually really promised to look after healthy sons and daughters of Jonathan, or handsome ones, or clever ones. In fact, we're told twice, aren't we, that Mephibosheth was lame in both feet. Verse 3, and very, the very last words of the verses, of the chapter in verse 13. That for David doesn't matter. It's not a positive or negative thing. That for David just emphasizes the point that this covenant love is something I've made. It's a commitment. It is a promise. And I am going to carry it out. It is fixed. And so isn't it then in David what we're seeing? A picture of the Messiah. King David's greater son. Isn't this what we find Jesus doing? But in even greater measure if that is possible. Isn't it really a picture of the gospel, this entire story? There are loads of pointers, so we're going to work through them, okay? I think there's loads of ways that this chapter is just the gospel in, in outline in a real-life situation. 
In the gospel we find we are chosen, aren't we, not because of anything of ourselves. We're chosen because of God's covenant love. Because of God's grace towards us as his people. Ephesians 1 verse 4. 4, this is God chose us in him, that's in Christ, before the creation of the world. To be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. God's action, unconditional. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. Or Romans 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You and I haven't been saved because God looked ahead in time and saw our potential and thought, yep, yeah, I'll have him, I'll have her. You, haven't been, you and I haven't been saved because God knew that we'd be good guys to have on his team. You and I haven't been saved because God thought, you know what, they've sinned less than them, so we'll, I'll choose them. There's no room for boasting for any of us from any of this, is there, when it comes to being rescued by Jesus. It is grace, 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 and more grace. But then in Jesus we also see the welcoming of the expected, of the unworthy. Jesus does it all the time. He, he welcomes people in and eats with them. So when he calls Levi, the tax collector, to be one of the twelve apostles, we find this. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I think about Zacchaeus, another tax collector. Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus is a little man. He can't see to get over the crowd to see Jesus come to town. So he climbs a tree. We know the story. Some of you have got it running around your head or the song from Sunday school. Jesus stops, looks up, sees him, says, come down, I'm coming to your house for some food. In both those stories, the religious leaders are miffed. The same thing happens with Zacchaeus. Why is Jesus eating with scumbags like Zacchaeus? He's a traitor. Jesus should be spending his time with us. We're the good guys. We're the ones who keep the rules. We're the ones who set the rules. We're the ones who look out for people. We tell them when they're doing it right and doing it wrong. We're not riffraff sinners like this lot. Think about the parable of the great banquet that Jesus tells. People are invited to the banquet. They've got fair warning. They're told about it. They're like, yeah, great, we'll come. Then the man says, right, the master of the house says, right, go and tell them it's ready. It's time to eat. And they go, yeah, can't do it anymore. I've got this, I've got that, I've got the other. And all their excuses are rubbish. The master of the house wants it full, so he says, right, servants, go out. Gather the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And then when they say, well, we've done that, and it's still not full, he says, right, go out again. Go out to the country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. Isaiah prophesied that the king would come and when he did the eyes of the blind would be opened and the ears of the deaf would be unstopped. The lame would leap like deer and the mute tongue would shout for joy. And when Jesus walks on the earth 600 plus years later we find him doing exactly that. He heals the sick, opens the eyes of the blind, makes the lame walk and sets the captives free. See, Jesus is even better than David at his best. Isn't he? You see what he does in the Gospels? You have to, you know, it doesn't take long to read the Gospel account to find Jesus doing exactly this, but on a bigger scale. Jesus loves the outcasts. Particularly in Luke's Gospel, you say that all the time. The people that Jesus speaks to and eats with and all sorts, particularly in Luke, but in all the Gospels, but particularly in Luke's Gospel, are the, are the ones nobody else wants to do anything with. All the ones who are marginalised in society. The weak, the needy, the poor. Others might look down on them, others might reject them, others might use them for their own ends, but not Jesus. Again, to get another children's song running around your head, probably, Jesus' love is very wonderful. Jesus is the friend of sinners, the welcomer of the outsider, the saviour of the lost. 
But also think about what happens when we are invited to eat at the table of the king. David invites Mephibosheth and says, you will always eat at my table. Every other week, once in the morning, once in an evening, we take communion around the table of the king. Jesus has invited us to eat and drink in remembrance of him. But it's still his table. It's to remember him, but it's his table. He is present as we take those elements together. And ultimately, that's a point of forward as well as a point of back. And the point of forward is to the great banquet of the Lamb. For those of us who know Jesus as Savior, we're heading for one day that will come, a day that we should look forward to with great anticipation, when we will eat the marriage supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19 verse 9 says, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. If you want to be invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb, to enjoy eating at the table of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords for eternity, the good news is that Jesus came into the world to save sinners like you and me, so we could. The good news is that though we are wretched, poor, blind, and, and lame spiritually, we can be blessed beyond all measure by repenting of our sin and trusting in Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. The good news is that as undeserving as we are, mercy and grace are ours in Jesus Christ. And so the reality is if you want that invite to that banqueting table for eternity with Jesus, you simply need to admit that you're a sinner, believe that only Jesus can save you, and then commit to following him. That's how you get to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Turn from sin and run to Jesus. As good as David is here, and he is very good here as a king, he points forward to a better, greater king. And we see it all over the gospel. But as much as seeing David pointing to Jesus, we also need to see Mephibosheth's reaction to the wonderful love and grace that David shows to him. Look what it says. Mephibosheth bowed down. Verse 8, this is... And said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? That's a pretty brutal way to describe himself, isn't it? A dead dog. I don't think I've ever described myself as a dead dog before. I imagine you haven't either. But what it shows here is that Mephibosheth realises he deserves nothing. He realises that everything David just said is nothing to do with anything in him. It is a response of humility and thankfulness. He doesn't think, oh my goodness, it's about time I've been sick of living in Lord Dubai. It's such a rubbish place. I should have been in Jerusalem all along. Finally, David's got round to bringing me there. He doesn't think, you know what, my granddad was king. This has always been my, I hope he backdates all this, you know, this payment. It's not what he's sat there thinking, is it, at all? Dead dog he describes himself as. He realises this is entirely grace. There isn't anything lower, really, than a dead dog, in, 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 particularly in that culture. There's, uh, nowadays, we might think of something lower that wasn't anything lower. Mephibosheth realizes this is faithful covenant love and grace from David. There is, again, nothing about him for David to choose him. He doesn't deserve anything, but he's getting the best. There isn't anything better than being in Jerusalem with the king, eating at his table. That's like the top of the top. If you get to eat at the king's table, you're like, that's it. There isn't, you can't go higher. Who, else, who else's table are you going to eat with that's better than the king's? So the question for us then lies, what is our response to the gospel that we've just heard? Because we're saying, aren't we, that as good as David is, Jesus is better. And as good as and as wonderful it was for all of this, for Mephibosheth to be given all of this and invited to that table, if Jesus is better, then what we've got is better than that. So what is our response then to the covenant love and faithfulness and commitment of the Lord Jesus to us? What is our response to his love for us? To his choosing of us? To his coming from heaven to earth and then to the cross to die in our place? 
and pay the price for our sin. What is our response to that? Do we realise, like Mephibosheth does, that we are completely undeserving? Again, the words from that story I read earlier from Jesus calling of Levi speak about this. Don't we? Jesus says, look, I didn't come to call the righteous. In other words, people who think they're okay, people who think they've got it sorted, people who think they can get to God by themselves, Jesus didn't come for them. They don't, they don't think they need me. I came to call, he says, sinners to repentance. In other words, people who are ready to admit, like Mephibosheth is here, that we've got nothing. That we are sinners deserving of judgment. Not good people deserving of a pat on the back. And doesn't the fact then that we are completely undeserving make us then want to praise the Lord, to bow humbly before him as David does, as Mephibosheth does here before David, and to ultimately be eternally thankful? Imagine every day Mephibosheth woke up after this, he's thinking, oh, I'm in Jerusalem. Oh, I get to go and have breakfast with the king. Like, that must have just sat with him for it. It must have been mad to get out of the routine of thinking, I'm, I'm in Lodi Bar, I'm in the middle of nowhere, I don't know what I'm getting from the breakfast today. Actually, every day... It would have amazed him, right? See, if our response to the gospel is not humble repentance, if our response to the gospel is not utter amazement, if our response to the gospel isn't abundant thankfulness, then we haven't understood it, have we? I say that as much to myself as I say it to you. We've either not understood it, that we are undeserving and wretched sinners before a holy God, or... We've not understood the incredible mercy and grace and the supremely costly sacrifice of the Son of God to make us his own. It's funny, the words of the chorus came to mind as I was editing this this afternoon. So I looked up the full song. Sadly, I think the songwriter, um, a bit like some of the old hymn writers, there are a few like this where they wrote a brilliant song and then they wandered away from the gospel years later. This is another example of that. But I'm going to read it in full because I think it sits well as a prayer for us to close in light of that truth. That if, we, if we've lost that amazement or that thankfulness or that, that wonder of the gospel, then we need, to, we need to recapture it. God needs to recapture our heart to it. So this is, this is the song. Um, and we'll, we'll then pray to close afterwards. Use this as a prayer as I read it, if you think to yourself, yeah, I have lost really a bit of that awe of the salvation that I've received. O precious sight, my saviour stands, dying for me with outstretched hands. O precious sight, I love to gaze, remembering salvation's day. Though my eyes linger on this scene, may passing time and years not steal, the power with which it impacts me, the freshness of its mystery. May I never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. May I see it like the first time, standing as a sinner lost, undone by mercy and left speechless, watching wide-eyed at the cost. May I never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. Behold the God-man crucified, the perfect sinless sacrifice. As blood ran down those nails and wood, History was split in two. Behold the empty wooden tree, his body gone alive and free. We sing with everlasting joy. For sin and death, they've been destroyed. Yes, sin and death, they've been destroyed. May I never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. May I see it like the first time, standing as a sinner lost, undone by mercy and left speechless, watching wide-eyed at the cost. May I never lose the wonder, the wonder of the cross. Let's pray.